Amen. Amen. Well, if you have your Bible, I'd love for you guys to open up to Matthew chapter 9. Matthew chapter 9. Okay. We're going to talk a little bit about missions. How many people are excited about missions? Lift your hand up. Hopefully there will be more of you who are excited about missions after we're done here. All right. Before we talk about that, I want to go back and uh, just talk a little bit just about our, our vision statement from New Life Fellowship. We've had this mission statement for many, many years, and this is what we strive for as a church. This is what we work towards as a church. There's three main parts to it. The first part, I don't know every word off by heart, but I know the, the basic idea. The first part is what? Does anybody remember what the first part of our vision is? To plant a large New Testament church that has influence on the, on the seven sectors of society, the seven parts of society, which is, uh, which is religion, which is sports, which is entertainment. Uh, there's a number of them. And we want to plant a new, a large New Testament church. Why a large church? You know what? Because God likes big families. Amen? God likes big families. God is not limited. God is not just, oh yeah, this is enough. No. God's love is not just for us. God wants us to have an outward focus. Like he has an outward focus. He, you know, think about before the beginning of time, before he created any, everything. There was God the Father, God the Son, God the Holy Spirit. It lived in harmony even before God created the earth. There was a relationship of love between the three of them even before God created the world. And he said, he, he, when he created, he created man so that he could welcome more people into that love relationship. And so that we can be part of, of that relationship. We can have relationship with the Father. We can have relationship with the Son. We can have relationship with the Holy Spirit. God invites us into his family. God calls us. Remember that word calls. God calls us into his family. And so God is interested in a large family. God is not just happy. God is not happy just with what we have here. God's always thinking about Who's out there? Who's outside the walls? Who's outside the church? Who hasn't heard the voice of God yet? Who hasn't experienced the love of God yet? That's what God is interested in. The second part of our vision, anybody remember what the second part of our vision is? It's to be an influence, to be an example, to be a resource center. We're not just thinking just about our church, but how can we have an impact on how, how can we be a blessing to other places, to other uh, churches, to other ministries who maybe they don't have the same resources? We want to be partners together. There are other ministries that do what we can't do. There are other ministries that, we, that, that, that build houses or dig wells or do different things. We can't do all that stuff, but we can be good at what we can do. And so as we partner together with other ministries and other resources here in Phnom Penh and in Cambodia, we can see more and more and more growth. And so we bring what we have, other places bring what, we, what they have, and we work together to see the kingdom of God continue to grow and continue to, to advance. The third part of our vision statement is to see missionaries sent from our church to different places in Cambodia, but also to other countries. And we thank God for the opportunities that we've had over the years. We've seen, uh, we've seen Life Band go to different countries because of what God's doing in here. And people have invited Life Band to go to different places. We've seen other ministries, other pastors, and other leaders from New Life Fellowship go to different countries. But God's not done with that yet. God's, God's got more in store. God's got bigger vision. God's got more in store for our church. And you know what? This vision won't 
be fulfilled by just us sitting here and waiting for it to happen. God wants to use some of you to fulfill this vision. God wants to use some of you to be that influence in your area, in your workplace, in your school, in, your, in, in, in the place that God has put you. God means for you to be a light, to be a shining light. God wants to send some of you, I believe, to be missionaries to other places. Maybe for short term, maybe longer term, God wants to use you. God wants to use you. Turn to your neighbor and say, God wants to use me. God wants to use you. Tell your neighbor, God wants to use you. This is God's plan. He doesn't want to, God, God isn't just a God who saves us and then we just kind of wait around for us to die and go to heaven. No, no. God's got a plan. God wants us to be active. God wants us to be thinking about, okay, God, what's next? What's next? What do you have for me? What's, who's the person that you want me to, to speak to? Who's the person that you want me to, to share the good news with? Josh, God has someone for you. God wants to use you. God has a calling on your life, Josh. He does. He does. Believe it. You're young, and maybe you're a little embarrassed right now. But believe it. God's got something for you, Josh. Expect. Expect great things from the Lord. Expect. Live a life of expectation. God's got something for each one of us. Live that way. Live that way where you say, God, what is it, what is, what is it that you have? How can you use me? How can, how, can, how can I use my talents for your kingdom and for your glory? And this is what God wants. This is how God wants to use us. God has called us to be people who are not just called to him, but people who are sent out by him as well. Let's read in Matthew chapter 9. We all know the stories about when, God, when Jesus had his ministry on the earth, when he called the disciples. You know, we read about uh, Peter and Andrew and James and John. They were the fishermen. Jesus walked along the shore, called them, said, said follow me and I will make you fishers of men. But it wasn't just a call to follow him. There was more that God, that Jesus had in, plan, in store for him, for them. And we see some of that in Matthew chapter 9. I'm going to start reading at verse 36. This is talking about Jesus. It says, But when Jesus saw the multitudes, he was moved with compassion for them, because they were weary and scattered like sheep having no shepherd. Then he said to his disciples, The harvest truly is plentiful, but the laborers are few. The harvesters are few. Therefore, pray the Lord of the harvest to send out laborers into his harvest. So what did Jesus tell the disciples to do? This is not a trick question here. We just read it. What did Jesus tell the disciples to do? Pray, right? Okay. Jesus told his disciples, pray. Pray, pray that... The Lord of the harvest would send out who? Harvesters, laborers, people to go and cut down the harvest and bring the harvest in. Obviously, Jesus was talking about a spiritual harvest and people who, who are lost. And, you know, he's, he said they were like people, they were like sheep, had no shepherd. He wants people to, to know the, the good shepherd. He wants people to know him. This is his heart. This is his desire. Jesus said to his disciples, okay, many people who do not know the good shepherd, so pray, pray, pray. Pray that the Lord of the harvest would send out laborers, send out harvesters. This is what Jesus said. Now, when Matthew wrote this book of the Bible, they didn't have chapters and verses, okay? It was just like one big long letter or one big long story. Nowadays, we have chapters, and when you look in our Bible, we have, you know, we have chapters and verses and stuff. It's all kind of broken up. 
But that wasn't how it was originally written. It was originally written as, you know, one big long story. Unfortunately, right here at the end of chapter 9, there's a big break. And it looks like there was two different stories. But it's a continuation in Matthew chapter 10. Okay? And so immediately after Jesus says this, pray that the Lord of the harvest would send out laborers. This is what happens in chapter 10. Listen to what happens. It says, And when Jesus had called his twelve disciples to him, he gave them power over unclean spirits to cast them out and to heal all kinds of sickness and all kinds of disease. Now the names of the twelve apostles are these. First, Simon, who is called Peter, Andrew, his brother, James, the son of Zebedee, and John, his brother, Philip, Bartholomew, Thomas, Matthew, the tax collector, James, the son of Alphaeus, and Le Lebeus, and whose surname was Thaddeus, Simon the Canaanite, and Judas Iscariot, who also betrayed him. These twelve Jesus sent out. So at the end of chapter 9, Jesus says to the disciples, Okay, pray. Pray that the Lord of the harvest would send out laborers. And then he says, Okay, you're it. Go. He sends them out. He says, Okay, we prayed, and now I'm sending you out. You know, you are the answer to people's prayers. God wants to use you to be the answer to people's prayers. Sometimes, sometimes I think in our Christian life, we need to stop praying and start doing to realize that this is what God wants. This is God's desire. Yes, absolutely pray. You know, we do our part, but we keep praying. But let's be, let's be motivated. Let's be mobilized. Because God has a purpose and a plan for our lives. We can't just say, yeah, I prayed about it, and that's good enough. No, God wants to send us out. God calls us, but then he sends us out. He sends us out to do the work that he has for us. Listen to how it continues to, to go on. It says, that These twelve Jesus sent out and commanded them, saying, Do not go into the way of the Gentiles. Do not enter a city of the Samaritans, but go rather to the lost sheep of the house of Israel. So we can see that, you know, at the end of chapter 9, Jesus said, they're like sheep having no shepherd. And then he says, go to the lost sheep of Israel. We see the, the, the continuation of this story in chapter 10. Jesus says, go rather to the lost sheep of the house of Israel. As you go, preach, saying, the kingdom of heaven is at hand. Heal the sick, cleanse the lepers, raise the dead, cast out demons. Freely you have received, freely give. How many people have freely received here today? Yep. Yeah. Yeah, we've freely received. Jesus says, it's time to freely give. Jesus called us. Jesus equipped us. Jesus is sending us. That's his desire and that's his plan. But there is a requirement on us as well. Okay? Jesus calls us, but what do we have to do? We have to follow. Someone just said it. You know, there are several, there are a number of different people in the Bible where we see stories that Jesus called certain people, but they didn't follow him. They said, oh, you know, I've got this concern or I've got that concern. I've got this issue in my life or I've got this or I've got that. Jesus calls us. It's up to us to respond. It's up to us to respond in faith. And if we're going to be missionaries, if God wants to use us, if we're going to go and be those laborers, it's important that we respond. That we respond and say, okay, yeah, yeah, Jesus, I'll follow you. You know, I'm amazed at the story. When Peter and Andrew were called, Jesus was walking along the shore, and we don't know all of the circumstances 
uh, that took place leading up to this. But Jesus said, all right, Peter, Andrew, come, follow me. And what does it say they do? They left their nets and followed him. They let, leaving their nets, that was all that they knew. They'd probably been fishing for fish since they were able to, to walk around. They followed their dad and, you know, they were playing around in the boat as little kids. And that's what they knew. That was their life. Jesus said, follow me. And they just, yeah, okay, let's go. They left their nets and followed him. James and John, the sons of Zebedee. Zebedee was probably a fisherman as well. They said they left their nets and followed Jesus. It is up to us to respond. It is up to us to follow him. But not just to follow as a one-time choice, as a one-time decision. That following Jesus was for the rest of their lives. They went to Samaria. Jesus went to Samaria. They went to Samaria. Jesus went to Jerusalem. They went to Jerusalem. Jesus went back to Galilee. They went back to Galilee. Everywhere that Jesus went, every day, they were following Jesus. And I think it's important for us as people who are followers of Jesus, not just to think, okay, my decision is a one-time decision. Yep, that's good. I'm, I'm going to heaven. I, I'm, a, I'm a Christian. Yeah, that's, that's good, and we're happy about salvation, but following Jesus is a daily event. It's a daily decision. We have to struggle with our flesh. We still have to make those decisions to trust in the Holy Spirit, train our flesh to follow the Spirit rather than what we want to do. Every day we need to make those decisions to continually follow Jesus. That's what it means to be a follower of him. Jesus called, we follow. Jesus, it also says in here that Jesus gave them authority. When we think about authority, especially the spiritual authority that Jesus gives us, it's important, it's vital that we live in faith. That we live in faith. Faith is saying, Jesus is my king. Jesus gave me this authority. And now the situations, the people that I meet, the you know, whether people are sick, like it says, they, they, Jesus told them to, to go and pray for the sick, cast out demons, do this and do that, preach the gospel, see miracles happen. It's a life of faith as well. Living in that authority. Utilizing that authority. Using that on a daily basis. Jesus gives the authority, but it's, us to, it's, it's our responsibility to live a life of faith depending on that authority, living in that authority, walking in that authority that Jesus gives us. And then it says, and Jesus sent. Jesus sent, Jesus sends, and we go. This is Jesus' purpose and his plan for our lives. You know, it's the same all the way from the very beginning of the Bible. Adam and Eve, what did Jesus tell them to do? Be fruitful and multiply, fill the earth. That was what God called them to do. Be fruitful, multiply, fill the earth. We see with Noah, you know, after the flood, God met with Noah, said the same thing. Be fruitful, multiply, fill the earth. God wants to do the same thing through all of us as well. God did not... I think we make a mistake as Christians... When we live our lives thinking that our Christian life is just about us. It's true that we're responsible for ourselves and we're responsible for the decisions that we make. But your life is not just about you. Your life is about so much more than you. It's about the people around you. It's, your, it's about your, your spiritual family, your natural family. It's about the generations after you as well. You are responsible not just for yourself, but how can you be an influence to everybody who's around you? And that's what God says right from the very beginning is that, okay, go and, and, and be fruitful and multiply. Let's see this thing continue on for generation after generation. You know, all of us in this room, you know, if God doesn't... if Jesus doesn't come back, we're all going to die. 
what's going to be left with our lives? It's not going to be the money you make. It's not going to be the stuff that you have. It's not, it's not going to be, you know, how many friends you had. I mean, well, it, it is something to do with that. But it's about what will last after us is our influence and how we can help people to know Jesus. What I want to see from my life is generations after me serving God because of how I've used my talents, how I've used the things that God has blessed me with. And that is fruit that remains. That is something that remains. People might not remember my name. People might not, you know, remember who I was. But you know what? That's okay. If more people know Jesus because of me, that's what I want to remain. Amen? That's what we want to see. And we have an opportunity as Christians to be people who influence others, to be people who, 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 who go, who are sent. It's true that God calls us, and Jesus calls us to follow him. And that's one of the greatest callings. But there's also a part of it where God wants us to go as well. And we see in the stories of Jesus that there were times when Jesus sent the disciples. They would go. I don't know. The, the Bible's not super clear about how many days they would go, but they would go. God, Jesus sent them out two by two to different towns and different villages. And then they would come back and report to Jesus. Yeah, we saw this happen. We saw, you know, these people healed. We saw uh, these demons cast out. We saw this happen. We saw that happen. You know, it's so great. And this is, you know, was, was Jesus' normal interactions with them. And later on when, when uh, after uh, Jesus died and rose again and ascended into heaven, all the disciples, they, they went to different countries. History tells us where many of the different disciples ended up. Some ended up in Asia and some in Europe. They say that uh, Thomas ended up dying in India somewhere. So they were scattered all over, but their fruit remains. Their fruit remains. And this is what we want to see with our life too. It would be a shame if the gospel stopped with us. We can't let that happen. Jesus, God said in Psalm 119 that he is faithful to every generation. Amen? God is faithful to every generation. He's been faithful to us. Let's show that faithfulness. Let's show that love. Let's show that gospel to the next generation, to those people who don't know him yet. There are people out in the mall, just outside these walls, that don't know him yet. They're going through a tough time, and God has put the answer in your life. God has given you the answer. God has given you hope. Maybe the things that you've struggled with in your life, and you've overcome in your life. God wants to use that in the lives of others to see them set free, to see them know Jesus, enter into a relationship with him, have hope again, live again, have life again. That's what God wants to do through you. Amen? So what can we do to prepare? Well, first of all, I'm super excited about this year because this year in New Life Fellowship, a missional year, a year of how can, how can God use us? How can we look out? How can, how can we do different things? And what's going to happen is, is we're going to have strategies. We're making up strategies and plans to, to see how God can use us, how we can take trips to our different village churches and, and do small mission trip with your small group or go here and go there to give you a taste of what God is doing, not just here in Phnom Penh, not just here in Staminche, but... You know, what is God doing in Kampong Tom? What is God doing in Krache? What is God doing in Batambang, in different places? What is God doing? Wait till you see what God is doing, not just here in Phnom Penh, but how God is setting people free, seeing miracles take place. God wants us to open our eyes to see what God is doing all over this country. Amen? And you can be a part of it. God wants all of us to be people who are sent out and use what we have. I believe, this is my personal belief, 
that each and every Christian needs to go on a missions trip, at least a short-term missions trip, once in your life. I, at least once in your life. At least. I would recommend more than that, but at least once. I remember the first time I came to, uh, to Cambodia. And, and I remember worshiping at the church, at New Life Fellowship, and it was in a different language, and I didn't know what was going on, but I could feel the presence of God there. God moves the same way that he moves in our church. He moves in other churches. He moves among other Christians around the world. It's not just here. It's not just our church. We're grateful and we're thankful for our awesome church that we have, but God is not limited to New Life Fellowship. There are other churches all around the country. There are other churches all around the world in different countries, worshiping in different languages, worshiping with different songs. But it's the same God, same spirit. And we are, that's the body of Christ. We're united together. So what can we do to, to prepare? First of all, be available. Live a life that says yes. Say, God, I'm here for you. You know, when we read in the Old Testament, and I've just been reading through 1 Samuel. And in 1 Samuel, God meets Samuel. And it was the very, very first time. You know, Samuel was living in the temple, in the, in the temple there. And, and uh, he was asleep at night. And the word of God came to Samuel. And God was calling Samuel. He said, Samuel, Samuel. And he thought it was uh, Eli. He thought it was the priest Eli. So he went running into Eli's room. He said, oh, you called me. And Eli said, no, I didn't call you. Samuel goes again, goes back to sleep. God calls again, Samuel, Samuel. And he, he thought it was Eli again. This was the first time that he heard the word of God. And he went to Eli. You called me. And Eli, he realized what happened. And he says, no, Samuel, it's not me calling you. This is God calling you. Next time God calls you, say, here I am. And so, sure enough, the third time God calls, Samuel, Samuel. And Samuel said, here I am. He said, here I am. And God wants us to have that heart that says, God, here I am. God, here I am. Whatever you want to do, wherever you want to send me, however you want to use me, here I am. I'm your servant. Here I am. And if you have an attitude like that, there's no telling where God might lead you. No telling where God might lead you. And don't be worried about, oh, I don't have the talents. I don't have the giftings. I don't have... No. God can use whatever. God used a donkey to speak to people. God used a, a little fish to, feed, to, to uh, uh, pay Peter's, Peter's and Jesus' taxes. God can use whatever he wants. God can use us. So don't say to God, no, 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 you can't use me. God knows who he can use, and if he's calling you, he's, he can use you. So we need to respond. Say yes to God. That being said, we should develop our giftings and talents that God has given us. If you have a talent to, you know, be an encourager, be the best encourager that you can be. If you have a talent to be, you know, a, an IT person, an IT guy. Okay, be the best IT person that you can be. Maybe God wants to use you out in a village church to teach IT people, to teach kids IT and information technology and that. And then they start to come and come to your class and then you can tell them about Jesus. Maybe you cut hair. All right, be the best hair cutter. Don't compare yourself. Oh, I can't do this. I can't do that. No, do what you can do. God has placed unique talents, unique giftings in each one of us for a reason. But be willing and use those talents and giftings. Be the best that you can be with those, but be available and say yes. The next thing we can do to prepare, invest in your relationship with God. Invest in your relationship with God. We do that through prayer, knowing the Bible, growing in character. All of these things will help us as we go, as we respond to that calling. Invest 
in your relationship with God. You know, the truth is that when we respond to God, there will be difficult times. There will be. Every one of the disciples faced difficult times. But you know what? Because they had invested so much, because they responded with faith, they continued on, and they were able to be used by the Lord. Think about what happened. You know, think about, I always think about uh, Peter. After Jesus rose from the dead, the tomb's empty. I'm sure Peter was like, all right, what do I do now? You know, what's going on? Um, and what Peter did, he ended up going back. He said, all right, I was a fisherman before. All right, I'm going to go back and go fishing. That's all I know. Jesus came to him and restored him. We know the whole story. But after that moment, Peter was used so mightily. We see in the book of Acts, all that he had, he used for, for, for the sake of the kingdom. He continued to build what Jesus was building, which was his church. So, Invest in that relationship with God. Continue to hold on. Continue to, 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 to seek the Lord. There will be difficult times, but you know what? That's just life. That's just life. But as we, as we go through those difficult times, hold on to the Lord and know that He is faithful day after day after day. Stay connected as well. Stay connected. Stay submitted to your leaders submitted to the church, connected to the church, connected with Jesus. And I think the last thing I would say as we're thinking about it and going and getting ready and seeking opportunity to, to uh, be the people that are sent by God, don't come to God with your plan. Don't come to God with your plan. All right, God, if you do this and this and this, then I'll go. Or I'll go if you do this and this. No. Expect the unexpected. Prepare for something that you don't really know. Just say, God, here I am. Just like Samuel said, here I am. Sometimes it's uncomfortable. Honestly, sometimes going on a mission trip is uncomfortable. You don't know what you're going to eat. You don't know what people are going to serve you. You don't know this or that. You don't know where it's going to end up. You don't, you don't know where you might end up sleeping. But you know what? That's okay. God is using people. God is using you. God is doing something in you. God is seeing things happen. And I think, honestly, I think when we're uncomfortable with things, God is a better chance of, I mean, God, God is more likely to move through us. Because when we're uncomfortable, we're more dependent and reliant on Him. Hey God, I, I don't really know about this. Uh, maybe I'm tired. I didn't sleep well because I had to sleep on the concrete floor last night or this or that. But you know what? God comes through. God comes through. And don't worry about being uncomfortable. Because God wants to use you and God will use you. So I just want to encourage each one of us that... In the next few months, we're going to have opportunities in the church here. We're going to have opportunities to go out with your small group or with different teams that are going out to different churches. Don't ask yourself, should I go? Okay, because Matthew chapter 28, verse 19 already settles that for us. Matthew 28, 19, he's, Jesus says, go into all the world. Okay, it's, it's settled already. The decision's already been made. We already know, okay? We already know that we should go. So, what you should do is say, God, what's the opportunity that you have for me? What's the opportunity that you have for me to go? And start saying, like Samuel, okay, God, here I am. Here I am. Send me. Here I am. Use me. I have my talents. I give it all to you. I'm willing to be uncomfortable. I'm willing to get out of my comfort zone a little bit. Maybe the place is dusty. Maybe the place is, you know, the food is this or that, or, you know, this is difficult. Okay, don't worry about that. 
God, I am here for you. I am here for you. How can you use me? Because God wants to use each one of us. Amen? There's not a person in this room that God doesn't want to use. God wants to use every single one of us. Amen. You know, in the Old Testament, God says that He wants to make the nation of Israel into a holy priesthood. A holy priesthood. God's desire was that every single person in Israel would be a priest. A person who represents God to man and who represents man to God. And who brings, who bridges that gap between man and God. And that's what God had a desire for all of Israel as well. And that's what God wants to do in our lives as well. God wants to use us, each one of you, to be a member of that holy priesthood. Who can you bridge that gap for? Who can you bring Jesus into their lives? And sometimes it's us bringing their lives to God in prayer, saying, God, look at my friend. They're going through a hard time. They don't know you. They don't have joy in their lives. God, do something for them. God, take a look at their lives. Do something for them. And then we can be an example and bridge the gap back to God. Say, all right, when you're talking with your friends, this is what my God has done for me. This is what God can do for you. That's what God wants to use. That's how God wants to use you. God wants to use everything that he's put within you. God made you special. God put talents and giftings. You're made uniquely because God has a, has a unique purpose and a plan for your life. Amen? Amen. Let's all stand up together. Hallelujah. Dear Heavenly Father, we lift you up. We praise you. We thank you for your hand upon our lives. We thank you that you are calling us, that you have a purpose and a plan for our lives. And we say, God, just like Samuel did, we say, God, here I am. Use me. Why don't you just say that to God right now? Say that to God. Say, God, here I am. Here I am. Use me. Take my life. Do what you want. Lead me your way. Say these words to God. Just spend a minute with God saying, God, my life is yours. Jesus, Jesus, here I am. Use me. Send me. Develop me. Help me to grow. Help me to represent you well to the people around me. And God, show me the opportunities that you have for me. Show me where you want me to go, what you want me to do. That as we step out in faith, God meets us and does a miracle in our heart and our lives. God, we give of our lives to you. God, we give our lives. God, we want to be people who respond and who follow you and who are sent out by you to see you do through us what you have already done in us. God, we know that there are so many more out there who have never heard the name of Jesus, who have never experienced peace, have never experienced joy, who have never experienced forgiveness of sins. God, how many millions are out there who still do not know you? God, fill us with compassion so that we can see and know and feel the way that you feel and know and see, like sheep without a shepherd. But God, use us. God, we thank you for your faithfulness to us. 
And God, we respond and we say, yes, God, we will go. Yes, God, we will go. Yes, God, we will respond. Yes, God, send us and use us. We make this our prayer before you, God. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. Amen.